so that those who have are yet to will, will, will do that. It is not this weekend, it's going to be next weekend. Okay, uh, Maxwell, so that's your response. The IA is not this weekend, it's going to be next weekend. I mean, so we will let you in as to how it's going to be done, when it's going to be done. Like I, as, as indicated, it's going to be either on a Saturday or a Sunday. If it's going to be a Sunday or Saturday, preferably, I would normally want, want to push it to between five and seven there about. It's going to be on Sakai, so you will have to take note and be prepared accordingly. So this takes us to This takes us to week six. And we are looking at demographic changes in, uh, in Ghana. And one of our areas of interest will be rural urban migration. So as we have indicated at the beginning of the class, this course seek to revisit almost all the institutions and the observations that we, we did last semester and to ask the question, how these institutions are faring now as compared to the previous discussion that we had? Have there been changes? If there have been changes, where do, did the changes come from? And more importantly, how has these changes affected the way we are able to satisfy our basic needs? Remember last semester we talked about social institutions as the, as the norms and values that governs the way and manner in which our basic needs are satisfied. We also talk about the fact that these basic needs are not satisfied independent of each other, and that it is a combination of the various social institutions that ensures that these needs are are not. So in your attempt to satisfy A, you probably will may require support or assistance or certain cooperation from C and what have you. And that is what we call the social structure, that the, com the, the combination of the various social institutions classified according to their various <clears throat> purposes, right? So, we need to have that bigger conversation. So last week, my colleague, Dr. So Dr. Amoa, walked you through how, how the political institutions have changed. And one of the critical questions that you always have to ask yourself is, what is the political institution meant to do? It was meant to ensure that you and I can have the freedom that we have. You and I are able to have security, you and I are able to ensure that the allocation of resources are done in a more equitable manner in all of you, right? Because the whole idea is that where your right begins or where your right ends, that is where somebody else. So we need to know the framework within which acceptable values, acceptable norms are. And one of the key institutions that were in charge of ensuring that these things were done was the chief tenancy institution. We talked about how over time the chief tenancy institution have changed and what is the current state and what are the current state actually means for all of us. And so we have had that discussion, right? And then we look at, in addition to the changes that have taken place, what other new institution has emerged? So the new political system that have emerged, this whole I think called representative democracy. We talk about the presidential system as against the parliamentary system. And in our case, we also have the second tier, which is the local government system, 
and I'm sure you've been following the discussion on um, the, the nomination and the confirmation process, as well as the rejection that have also characterized the nomination and the confirmation processes and all those other things. Yeah, so those are the changes that have taken place. What does that mean? What does that mean to the chief tenancy institution? What does that mean to governance and ability to satisfy their basic needs and all that? So that's the kind of discussion that we are doing. One of the key things that we are also talking about is the fact that the people who live in this territory appears to be changing. People are dying, all right. They are males, they are females. Who are they? What is happening? And what have you? So that is what today's discussion essentially is all about. People are moving, the issue of migration, people are moving from one area to one to the other. What are the factors behind their movement? And what does that mean to our ability to satisfy our basic needs as well? So these are quite critical things that we all need to observe. So essentially today, we'll be looking at the changes that have taken place in our population. So we are going to look at the population dynamics, the rural urban distribution, the male, female, the level of education and all that, because these are the characteristics, the things that are about the population, about the people who occupy this territory. Unfortunately, we don't have the current data because we just have a snippet, the highlights, as was released on 20 something, I don't know whether, I think I've, it's has escaped me by the Ghana uh, Sky Service. I will highlight and walk you through some of the key observations, yes. We will look at the causes of the change, what is happening, understand the factors that contribute, for example, to rural urban migration, but there's this whole idea that people are living in droves from the rural areas to the urban areas. What does that mean? What does that mean for the rural area? What does that also mean for the urban area? And then I ask my question, I ask this very question, is urbanization a problem? We appear to have, um, 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 categorize urbanization as a problem. And because we characterize it as such, we are always forced to find solutions. So I go back to what are some of the efforts towards reducing rural urban migration? I will discuss with you some of the current efforts or recent efforts by the state to address that. How sustainable these things are, are some of the discussion that we will be doing. As usual, this is supposed to be a very interactive section. If you have a question, kindly raise your hand and I'll give you an opportunity to, to ask. Is that okay? All right. So these are this is just a snapshot of how the population of Ghana has um, changed over the period. So the record suggests that the, the first attempt at some at enumerating the population, okay, in the territory that we now describe as um, as Ghana, was in 1948, and at that time the population was 4.1. Can you please mute your mic, Yawa? You are becoming a nuisance to all of us. Thank you. Right. In 1960, another attempt was made. And this time around, the population had increased to 6.7. And in that same order. I mean, the global acceptable practice for census is that every 10 years, the population must be counted. And Ghana appears to have been consistent at least in between. So for example, between 1960 and 1970, we were, on, we were consistent. 1948, instead of 1980, because we mixed it. Then we came back to 19, the 2000, we did it. 2010, we were okay. We were supposed to do this last year, but because obviously of the COVID and its impact, it has to be shifted to this year. Tentatively, the figure that has been projected based on the preliminary analysis suggests that the population of Ghana is now 30.8 million people. So between 1948 and 2020, 2021, the population of Ghana has jumped from 4.1 to 30.8.
and somebody will ask, what does this mean yet? It means a lot. You see, it gives you room for some of the analysis that you want to do. And sometimes I feel like as a country, we seem not to be having a discussion based on the loose nature of the conversation. 1948 to 2021. Look at the, the percentage jump in the numbers. And then you begin to ask yourself, what does that mean? Because if the numbers are increasing, then it means that we need probably to have a corresponding increase or improvement in the facilities that are supposed to be assessed by the student, by the teachers, by the general population. So if it's about roads, if it's about cars, if it's about this, if it's about this, and that's the kind of conversation. So essentially, if you look at it in terms of a chart, this is how the population has been doing. So from the 1960 up to the 2010 data, which have been plotted, this is how it looks like, right? So there's a, a continuous increase. And now we are looking at 30. So 30 is definitely going to be around here, okay? Another interesting observation is that whereas the general population appears to be growing, the fertility rate, okay, that measures the number of birth per a female within the reproductive age. And when we talk about reproductive age, we mean the women who can be, give birth, right? Women who can give birth. Okay. Sometimes the statistics will put them in very interesting scenarios, right? There appears to be a decline. So on the average in the 1988, when, when data is available, the average woman was giving birth to about 6.4, okay? The lowest ever recorded was in 2008, where the average woman within the reproductive age was giving birth to four. By 2014, there has been some slight increase to 4.2, right? But the current data suggests that the number might be decreasing. That is the rate at which the numbers are increasing. Uh, the population is growing, it's increasing. I think I have a, the data there, here. Look at this. Okay, even though the census data will normally not give us the fertility, I'm sorry, let me, the, uh, where is that data that I was looking at? Yeah, the census data will normally not give us the, the, the fertility rates. The Ghana Demographic Health Survey, which is done almost every five years, will give us that data. I'm, I've not seen the, the next round, which should have been 2019. I, I don't know whether it is available. I'll probably will search again and make you aware. Right. But if you look at this data, it, it tells you how the population has been increasing between censuses. So 1960 to 1970, the population was in, growing at a rate of 2.4%. And it meant that if things remain the same, the population that we had in 1970, which was um, 1970, which was 6.7, was going to double in 29 years. The reason why we are interested in the annual growth rate is because it gives us an idea of how you can project the population growth. Is that okay? Good. So by 1984, by 1984, the population rate was increasing. That is 2.6. And so you see that the doubling year then will reduce. 2000, and 2000 it was 2.7. And then the, the time required for the population to drop had also decreased. We had a slight decrease from 2.7 to 2.5, and then it will shoot us back. These were some of the provisional figures that were available in 2019, and the rate of decline increase was um, 2.18. 
which meant that the population of your city will be increasing in 30, 30 years plus, right? I'm going to share with you the, some of the nuances, nuances. Okay, so this was based on the 2010 population census, which now appears to have outlived its relevance because there's a much more recent data. Let me quickly look for that data and, and share it, some of the key findings with you. I saw it yesterday. I downloaded it yesterday. I don't know where. All right. I'm sure you can see my mail because the screen is still active. Okay, so can you still see my screen? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. So let's look at some of the key takeaways from the recent population census, the preliminary ones. I mean, things may change, but essentially not so significant, right? So the population that I indicated currently is 30.8 million, right? So what it means is that between the time of independence, Karen, I've seen you, I'll call you in a few minutes time. Yeah, Between yeah, please. what it's showing is the uh, 20 and what what is showing on your screen is the slides, not what you are showing on your computer. Oh, really? All right, okay. What All right, so maybe let me let me let me just um. All right, so thank you. So now you can see what I'm probably speaking to. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, because I made a mistake, I, I should have stopped the other slide. So if you look at the data in 1960, they are saying that since independence, our population has increased in fivefold. In fivefold, what it means is that, and that probably explains because by the time of independence, the population of Ghana was around 6 million. And we are now 30 million. So five times six, obviously, will give you that. Do you understand what it means? So that is how the population is. Ghana's population is growing, but at a declining rate compared with previous censuses. So what is, again, trying to say is that, yes, if you look at 2010, where the population was 24.7 or so, and now we are 30.8. Yes, the population is increasing, but the rate of the increase appears to be dropping. Remember, I show you one slide where I was giving you the rate of annual growth. One was 2.4, and then I will give you the corresponding doubling year and all that. So, so that is what essentially this line means. Consistent with previous uh, data, there are still more females in Ghana than males. And it says that this has been the trend for the last four censuses. And the last four censuses were, so uh, 2010, 2000, 1984, and then 1970. There will always be more females than there are males. We can go into the discussion and probably ask that question, why is it that there are more females than males? And then we can have some answers. But there are some Exceptions do, if, if you take the broad figure, yes, but if you do by region basis, and Karen, don't forget that we have 16 regions. It says that the females outnumber males in 10 out of the 16 regions. So what it means is that for six regions, there are more males than there are females. Is that okay? All right. And for the first time, Greater Accra then has more people than the Ashanti regime until recently or until 2021, Ashanti region was the most populous region in Ghana. Currently, it is no longer the Ashanti region. It is the greater Accra region. And quickly, let me say this, that even though even though um, Greater Accra was behind 
Ashanti region in terms of numbers, the general population. Greater Accra for the last two voting circles have always had more people on the voter register than the Ashanti region. So even though Ashanti region had more people, right, the Greater Accra region had the highest numbers of voters. What do you think may account for this observation? Yes, Karen, you can ask your question now, and then I will take other people's view on the question I asked. Karen, unless your question has been. Sir, please, I raise my hand. I raise my hand because of the screen sharing thing. All right, so thank you very much. Eno, can I hear you? Okay, sir, thank you. Um, so what I think is the reason why um, there has been increase, um, Greater Accra has overtaken Ashanti is as a result of the rural urban No, mind. no, wait, 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 wait. That's not the question I've asked you. The question I asked is that even though Ashanti region for the last two voting cycle, I've always had more people. And don't forget, the data says that this is the first time Greater Accra has overtaken Ashanti. In other words, until 2021, Ashanti region had more people than Greater Accra. But I'm saying that when it comes to voting, Greater Accra tend to have had more numbers on the voters register than Ashanti region. What do you think may account for these discrepancies? Okay. If we, 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 we can call it so. Okay, so one I think is um, education. How okay. people on how to vote and then the um, literacy rate. Okay, so that's an interesting one. Yes, um, Abanga, no, Abagna, Rahel. Yes, sir, good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, I, I also think maybe um, it could be that there are more aged people and children in the uh, in Ashanti region. That's why it's happening that way. Sorry, come again. The aged and like kids. Uh -huh. No, your question is like, why Why is it that, that why is it that Greater Accra has more uh, has more voters than, yes, yes. than Ashanti region? And I'm saying uh -huh. that it could be that uh -huh. in uh, Ashanti region, the, like there are more old women and men, like the aged and kids over there. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, Shelly. Shelly, can I hear you? Unmute yourself and speak. Shelly Bachuri. Okay, so it appears we are unable to hear Sherry. Shelly, um, who else is there? Mok. Ajiriba, Ajiriba Mok. Sorry if I mispronounce your name. You can unmute yourself and then. Uh, yes, sir. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Dennis. It's a grab Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I think why I think why the we have more voting population in Accra than Kumasi is that because of the centralization of governance in Accra. Can you explain further? Uh, when you look at it, the, all the government sectors are much based in Accra than in other regions. So people do come in. Okay, that's another interesting one. Yeah, yeah I mean, Dennis, I get your drift. Thank you very much. Josephine, and then followed by uh, Otukuno. Yes. Yes, yes, sir. Please. I also think that um, education is a factor because um, most of us come from. Um, Okay, most people come from the Ashanti region to school here, and after that, they have their internship here, they have their work here, and then they, they reside in Accra. And I also think that um, urban migration, because most people think that there are um, more jobs here in Accra. So they come from the Ashanti region, and most of them are, um, they, they are of the voting age. So they come here and settle here to make a living and then they begin to vote here. And I think um, th for the past years, we had uh, most children back there in the Ashanti region. That is why, or most people there, that is why they had 
the most population. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me take the last but two. The rest of you will probably listen to you another time. Okay, Anita and then Maxwell. I think these are just the two. Okay, Maxwell, you have lowered your. So, Anita, let me hear you. Okay, I think that the reason for um, massive improvement was that because we educated, there were, there were more volunteers in the counting process. That's why. Hey. Like people volunteered to embark in the counting of the census. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Anita, I'm sure you just joined the discussion. If not, Asamaba. All right, so thank you. Mama. So this is essential. I mean, there are a lot of possibilities. So good. You see, whereas uh, census, okay, count everybody. Voting is not for everybody. You ought to be 18 years to register to vote. Do you get it? Even though, and again, census is mandatory. In fact, if somebody comes to your house to count you and you refuse to be counted, you can be arrested and prosecuted. But voting is not mandatory. Right? Voting is not mandatory. And so, I mean, on the surface, what is more likely to have happened is the fact that um, there probably be more persons who are 18 years and older in greater Accra than those who are 18 years and older in the Ashanti region. Somebody talked about the migration bit because of the social amenities and the social facilities and the access to certain resources. That could play out very well as well. And most of the times, the people who migrate to Accra, for example, are people who are 18 years and then and about, right? But that same argument may also apply to the greater Accra, sorry, to the Ashanti region, right? But the cardinal thing is about 18 years and above, which may explain. And if the data comes and we are able to do that segregation, to be able to understand why, even though there were more people in Ashanti region, but there were more voters, people on the voting uh, register in Greater Accra than in the Ashanti region. But again, don't forget, for the first time, Ash Ash uh, Greater Accra has more people than Ashanti region. And I'm sure you also know that Greater Accra happens to be the region with the smallest geographical space. Right, Greater Accra is the region with the smallest geographical space. And so it tells you how dense Greater Accra then is. And so it's not surprising that currently the Greater Accra appears to be extending to the central region as well as the eastern region, right? And some people live in, in Saom, for example, and they still think that they are in the Greater Accra. Some people are in Kaswa and they think that they are in Accra. Some people are in Winneba and they think that they are in Accra. You know, some are living in Ebri and they still think that they are living in Accra. And all the smaller, smaller towns in the Eastern region that share borders with Greater Accra appears now to be more like, again, because the territory is too small and we are expanding and all that, so right. Now, Ahafo. And again, don't forget, the region was divided into two. Right, the Brong Ahafo region has been divided into. It was it divided into three or two? No, two. Yes. So we have the bonus side and we have the three. Side. That was also divided into three. Wait. Yeah. So we have Bono. Is it Bono East? Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, and then we have the Ahafo before we have the original BA. The Ahafo side has replaced Upper East 
as the nation with the least population, right? In other words, Upper West appears to be the region with the lowest population as of 2010. But because of the division that was done in the train, uh, uh, in the regions of the Bono Bahafo, the Bahafo side has the smallest, and we can go and look at the data. Another interesting observation is that the average household size is also declining. And as at now, it is now 3.6 members. In other words, if you go to every household today, and we talk about average household, household normally refers to the number of people who, uh, the demographic we say, who share a meal from a pot. In other words, on a regular day, if especially dinner is prepared, how many people are, is the dinner meant to, to, to be fed, right? And the number appears to be declining. And currently we have barely 3.6 members. In other words, it is just father, mother, that is two, and then maybe a child. But again, even though we don't have a 0.6 member of a family, if you are doing it in terms of numbers, we we'll probably will run it off to say that there are four persons in a family. And indirectly, what we are leaning towards is the European model, where we have what they call the replacing population. When we talk about replacing population, it's like the father, mother, and two kids. And we say replacing because when the father and the mother is no more, then the two kids that they give birth to replaces them. So their population then remains the same. It is not increasing. But they are currently, some European countries are experiencing declining population because one, they are not giving birth. And those who are giving birth are only giving birth to numbers below that. I mean, Germany was one of such countries that was experiencing declining. And some areas, for example, in Spain, have been declining significantly over the past couple of years, right? Another interesting thing about this census this year is that we have over 10.7 million structures, 10.7 million structures. And this includes almost everything that you people can live in. Some, about 20% of these were metal containers, what we all know, containers where people, some were kiosks and some were the wooden structures, right? 20% of them. One out of every five of the structure listed was not fully completed. And I was very happy with this because if you look at, and you are driving around the country, there are so many abandoned projects. And sometimes we make it appear that it is the, 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 it's only government property, but these are private buildings. And even if you go to your home, I'm sure you are more likely to see that in and around your house, they will probably, in fact, you are either living in an uncompleted house or somebody next to your house or somebody two blocks away from your house is living in a, some of the houses are not even occupied because they haven't been completed. And some of these structures have been there for over decades. Right, and what have you. Now, another interesting thing about it is that six out of these 10 structures that are being mentioned are for residential. In other words, what it means is that if we had 10.7 million structures, okay, that are readily available, okay, 10.7, and 60% of them, okay, are incomplete. Then this whole discussion that we've been having in this country about accommodation being in shortage and all those things, we should be questioning that quite what? Because 6.7 of them are, I mean, six out of 10, uh, residential. So if all these houses that have been either built by private individuals but haven't been completed and have been abandoned were to be completed, there should be more than enough houses 
to house almost everybody in this country. Because what it means is that we have over 6 million buildings for residential purposes. And our population is just 30 million. And you are not telling me that each house has, cannot take five members. Because if you have 6 million and the population is 30 million, then what it means is that every five people can have a house, one share, one uh, residential apartment or residential structure and what have you. Right, so it, this, so these are some other ones. So this is, remember we have said that the population is increasing but at a decreasing rate. And this is how the data captures it. I'm sure you can, you can see it. Population growth and size, population size and growth rate. So in 1960, the population was 6.7, 8.6, 12.3, 18.5, 17.5, 3, 18.9, and this was the peak in terms of rising. So by 2000, our population has been decreasing. The rate of growth has been decreasing. The rate of growth has been decreasing, right? And I will share this document with you and you will read and you understand what we mean by the rate has been decreasing. So let me just read the first paragraph with you and then to get a point. The population has increased by 6.1 million. That is, if you subtract 30.8 from 24.7, you are getting 6.1 million from this recorded in 2010, constituting an annual intercensor. That is the period between the sensor, census rate of 2.1%, right? This rate is less than what was observed in the preview. That's when you do 2000 and 2010, which was 2.5, do you get it? So between 2000 and 2010, the population increased by 2.5%. But this year, between 2010 and 2021, it has increased by only 2.1. So that's what we mean by increase, but in a decreasing manner. And the 2.1% is the lowest observed since independence. So this is what they are saying. So at this rate, the country's population will double within 33 years. So remember, we had come to a point where the population was going to double within 26 years. If you remember the, the slide I have shown you earlier. But now they are saying that it is going to double in 33 years. And by 2050, the population of Ghana will be over 50 million. So essentially, that's one of the things I want. I have talked about the fact that there are more females. So when you pick 97 males, it will be equivalent to 100 male females. And that's what they talk about, right? And so this is also the regional distribution. Remember, we have said that I have has the least numbers. This is it, 564,536. And Greater Accra has the highest of 5,446,237. Slightly ahead of um, Ashanti region, which is 432. So the population is just, so 446, I want to quickly do the calculation, just so we will know the, the difference between Ashanti region and Greater Accra. I think it's just a little over 60,000 or so, 32, sorry, 432, 485. So it's just a little about 13,000. So 13,752 people. So there are more, there are 13,752,000 mm -hmm. more people in Greater Accra than in Kumasi followed by the Eastern region. So the Eastern region now becomes the second most, pop, pop, third most populous country, then the central region. The Northern region is the fourth largest region. Is it the, yeah, the fifth largest region in Ghana, followed by Western region, Vota region, Upper East, Bono. Up, sorry, okay, I think there's a mistake here. This is Upper East, Bono East, Upper West. Don't forget, Upper West was the smallest region by 2010. Now we have Western North, Oti, North East, Savannah, and all that. So 
essentially these are some of the critical things that I wanted to. In terms of distribution, if you look at the data and you want to spread it, this is how it looks like. Okay, so Greater Accra accounts for less than 20% of the population of Ghana. That's also very interesting because sometimes we make Greater Accra appear as if it has almost everything, the population, but it's just a little over 17% almost the same as Ashanti region because the difference was just about 13%, right? Followed by um, which is 9.5, Central 9.3, Northern region is 7.5, West Thin is 6.7, Volta is just 5.4, Upper East 4.2%, Bono 3.9%, Bono East 3.9%, Upper West 2.9, Western 2.9, OT, and the rest. So, so that's how it looks like in terms of so they are. All right. So this is a, a brief highlight of the 2021 uh, census. The preliminary one, the, the, the much more detailed ones will be submitted. And when they do, I will share with you as well. Any question up to this stage? Any question up to this stage? Any question up to this stage? So this is also, this was the 2010, some breakdown that I did, right, that we could do. And, but, said, but these are very important. If you look at this data, those who were below 14, this was the spread. There were about 9,450,000. If you compare it to the, now look at very, some very interesting thing that this data gave us. And I think that was probably why I, I highlighted it the last time. Whereas the general population suggested that there were more females than male, if you look at those who were 0 0.4, 0 to 14 years, there were more males than females because we had 4.7 million. That's against 4.6 million. Have you seen it? If you take 15 to 64, 15 to 64, even that is where the difference then comes. The gap is so huge. Almost 600 or 500,000 difference. Right? Because this is 731. Let me quickly do that analysis as at 731294 minus 6727948. That is 584,000. 997 females more than males. And interestingly, we are living in a country where marriage is generally heterosexual. What I mean is that marriage is seen generally as a relationship between a man and a woman. So what it actually meant was that if these people were to be in that same category and all of them are potentially supposed to get married, then we are going to have more than half a million of that population not going to find a husband, especially if marriage is supposed to be monogamous marriage. And that is of critical essence. And this is as at the time we were looking at it because now look at those who are 65 years plus. Again, the data is also obvious. There were more females than males. Look at this, 669579, as again, 49. So even within that bracket, then if you put all the adult population, that is those who are 18 years and above, again, the difference is also obvious. Right, 7.2 as again, 6.4. And so you begin to look at all these things and then you, you, you won't have a very candid conversation with yourself as to what that means and what would that imply 
Um, Richmond, Famiye, I would like to hear you. So unmute yourself and speak. Yeah, thank you, sir. Like, I wanted mm -hmm. to, I wanted to ask that, like, as you said, there are 60, 60 million more structures and the, our population is just... Yeah, I, didn't say, <laughs> I didn't say 60 million. The entire, the entire the, structures enumerated was a little over 10 million. And they said oh, that okay. six out of the 10, in other words, 60% of the structures enumerated were for residential purpose. That's what I mean. Okay, that's then I didn't get that. Sorry. All right, that's okay. So that is what the data said. All right. Now, another critical uh, feature of this whole thing is about life expectancy. Life expectancy is, simply means how long the average person is expected to live before he dies, all things being equal, right? All things being equal, how long would it take for um, um, a Ghanaian born and living in the current environment live? And if you look at the data, consistently the population, the, 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 the life expectancy appears to be improving. It has always been to the detriment of males. And you have to answer that question, why you think males tend to live sh uh, shorter than women? Yes. Jeffrey, Anina Kwa, your hand is up. Yes. I can hardly hear you. Your line is so terrible. So I think I should take another person. Family. Yes, sir. So the reason mm -hmm. why a females live longer than males is because like in our parts of the world, like it is the duty of males to like work and cater for females. So maybe the work and the stress and all that reduces our age as compared to females. That's an interesting one. Uh, yeah. Karen, let me hear you. After that, I'm taking uh, who else? Uh, Emmanuel Sepona, uh, Sepona, uh, and then I will do Mahamai. Enoch, yeah, yeah. and then, um, yeah, so who are you? This is Karen. Karen, go ahead. So please, the males are seen to be more daring than the females. And like they okay, tend thank to you take more risks. And also in the past, it's the men that I used to go for the wars and those things. And some of them tend not to come back home. But it's now that they're, they're allowing females to join the military and things like that. So that's why, like, the men tend to have a shorter lifespan than the women. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, Mahama and then Ima. Thank you, sir. So, um, mostly males are always those who go through every difficulty. I take the socioeconomic life of our, our our societies is the males who do everything in terms of the economic life, the work, the social life, and everything, providing for the family and everything. And you know, um, as as they always say, it's not easy to be, to be a man. A lot of a lot of the things out there is the males, and majority of them they go through frustrations. Other staffs also hinders their age and all that. All right. Yes, the next person. Yes, uh, uh, so I think this is because um, females take good care of themselves more than males. So, for instance, uh, the kind of food they eat, females prepare their own food, but uh, most of the males, they go out to buy food from outside. That's it's detrimental to their health. Okay, that's another interesting one. Thank you very much. Yes, who else? Rawuda. Uh, so I Sir, think it's because so, um, the, I think 
So I, I think know, it's because. On. So I think it's because the mental health of male mm. aren't taken seriously, and that causes depression. And then men are told to not speak about their feelings. So the suicide rate of the male is okay, higher so than the co- female. They are cultural. They are cultural factors as well. Thank you very much. Yes. yes. Uh, you know. Let me hear you. Well, okay. So she mentioned part of it, but I will also make my submission. Um, first, our culture makes it's not even our culture, the whole society makes it look like everything dangerous is supposed to, every work that is dangerous is supposed to be done by the, the, the male gender. And for that, it um, increases the risk of um, mortality in the male gender. And also, as um, um, the one who just spoke said, we are trained up in a way that male are not supposed to complain when they have issues, when they have um, um, a mental or, or personal issues that is causing um, depression. And for that, they are not able to cope with, if they are, they are, they are not able to cope with such um, issues, they end up ending their lives. Thank you. And who else want to have a bite of the cherry? Abubakar, so you are the last person. Then we will, we will continue. Hello, sir. Yes, Please, go ahead. I think most um, the males are dying because whenever they are sick, instead of them to go to the hospital, they will wait for the sickness to worsen before they will go to the hospital. And then it's too late Thank for you. them. All right. All right. So, you know, all these things that you are saying are all factual. Some are a bit related. Some appears a bit. So you have to be a bit more analytical and explain. So, for example, the last one, the last point that a worker made, why is it that men are hesitant in going to a hospital? We should be able to explain it so that it becomes a very sustainable point. It is true. I mean, in, in, the, in, in our part of the world, men will force to send their kids who are sick or insist that their wives go and see the doctor. But they themselves are very unwilling to go and see the doctor. And then because of that cultural barrier, by the time they, they are forced to go to the hospital, like Abu Bakr said, the situation has deteriorated to the point where it becomes very difficult for them to to survive, right? But again, beyond all that, biologically, the female gender is actually the strongest. The female gender is actually the strongest. In fact, the environment or health conditions that may a baby boy may not survive, a baby, a baby girl has a higher likelihood, right, to survive. I don't know why, for some strange reason, We've all lived in this socially constructed perception that has created that analysis of perception that the, the female gender is actually the weakest. But biologically, the, 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 the female gender is the strongest of the two genders, right? I don't know how this whole construction came in to the point where we feel that anyway, I mean, people also say that sometimes the way to overcome your weakness is to creates an invisibility and that cultural construction appears to have succeeded globally to the extent that men now assume that they are more strong, much stronger, they are more much competent, they are more analytical and all that than the female gender, which actually biologically appears to be much more stronger than, than the female, than the male gender. So all those other things, that cultural uh, uh, constructions had then created that uh, uh, um, um, mindset, right, in the man. So he says he won't show up at the hospital. When something terrible happens, he says, and then the man is supposed to face all the dangerous things and in the process they die. The, I mean, again, look at all the risky jobs. And I think that was one of the points that was made earlier. The first point. Most of the risky jobs are done by, by males. So you go for war, they are the ones who are driving, they are in the speed racing, they are males who are doing the boxing, 
the kickboxing and all those other things. So men are generally in that very uh, risky environment. So all the socially constructed issues, all the biological factors and the cultural factors are important to explain this. Uh, um, differences. Enoch, I don't know if your, your, the, the, the hand that is up is recent. If it is recent, can you go ahead and speak? All right, thank you very much. So why the changes in biology? So I've said that if you look at it, in, despite all the things that we are saying, for the past 30, 40, 50 years, the life expectancy of the average Ghanaian is improving significantly. So we have moved from an average of 38 for males to 60. And in fact, I suspect that the 2021 one will also probably take out the males to about 62 or 63 and females to about 65, right? I mean, my parents are all alive and they are all 80 plus, right? But the, the reason why we talk about the life expectancy is, is a measurement of the average, right? I mean, we all know people are dying at age one. Some even die under one, age one, and what have you, yes. So, but on the average, all things being equal, if you live in this current environment, this is how long you are going to live and survive. What are the factors behind this increase? So there are three things that we normally will talk about. The first one, we talk about improvement in female education. And, and, and there are a lot of studies that have suggested that any additional year that a woman spends in school, right, improves her life as well as the children she will bear by almost four times, right? In other words, you having come to the university, the likelihood that your child, when you give birth to die, is much lower, right? Because you won't just give anything to your child. You know what it means. Your eye will be on the child and all that. There's another dimension to that whole thing too, is that women who tend to have higher education tend to have higher social mobility. In other words, their income levels appears to be higher. They are, and again, they may even give birth to fewer numbers. And as they give birth to fewer children, they are more likely to be able to take good care of them as compared to those who never went to school and might have given birth to so many children that they cannot even cater for them. So that is another very important thing. Again, it's also because, I mean, relatively our economies are improving. People are earning more money. They are any more resources there are any more opportunities than they have ever done, right? And so they are eating well, they are giving the best of attention to their children and themselves and all those other things that you need an improved economy. Finally, we are talking about the improvement in medical science generally. So for example, if you look at the impact of COVID, between the first time that COVID emerged and now, you realize that the mortality rates are completely different. Fewer people are dying now than they did because now we have understood a bit more of the virus and how it behaves and how it can be killed, right? And all that. So the vaccine yesterday, one of the greatest news was the vaccine for malaria. And in Africa, malaria kills almost about 20 or more percent of all mortalities recorded in Africa. And now we have a vaccine, a vaccine that will, will work against malaria. You can imagine the breakthrough that that will mean, the number of children who are going to survive the number of adults who are going to survive because of the vaccine, the malaria vaccine, that is to be deployed very soon, right? So as this technological breakthrough comes, 
diseases that we in the past would have killed people because there's, I mean, one of the things that we, for example, learned in our early days is about uh, the six childhood diseases. When we were growing up, we were growing up in an environment where polio, uh, diarrhea, um, um, diphtheria, uh, cholera, cholera, cholera. The rest were killing so many people, right? So, but now it is not because of the deployment of vaccines and other things. In fact, four or five generations earlier, yellow, uh, what do you call it? The yellow fever had killed so many people, so many people, until we had this vaccine for the yellow fever, right? And we were supposed to take that vaccine once every 10 years. Last year or two, it has now come that the kind of vaccine, the improvement that they have seen in the vaccine, I mean, should be for a, a lifetime. That once that is deployed, okay, you have it for the for your for a lifetime. And so all these things will ensure that the things that will kill or kill other people. Well, so there's massive improvement in medical science. And medical science here, not only in terms of um, medicine, okay, but it's also in technology, right? And even the skills of care, right? The skills of care has also significantly improved, right? So for example, during the COVID, some people discovered that when people are coming and they are struggling to call, and you made them to lie in a portrait, you worsen the situation for them. But when they lie or on one side, it eases the ability to breathe, taking oxygen and all that. And so the earlier phases, the lack of that knowledge, right? probably might have caused many more people to die. But now, because of the improved knowledge, such people wouldn't have died. Any question, please? If there are no questions, then I'll move to the, to the second phase. I personally think that this is what we all need to know. So essentially, again, going back to the data, until recently, there were more people living in areas that we can re refer to as rural communities than in a... Right. So this is how the distribution, and you, you see that year on year on, the numbers were decreasing in the rural communities and those in the urban centers were increased. By 2010, we had more people living in urban community than those living in the rural community. What do you think may account for this? Yes, Why, what do you think may, may account for this? Where there are more people living in urban communities than those living in smaller or rural communities, yes. Yes, Abagna. Education. What has ed education got to do with that? Um, sir, please, I didn't make that point. Mine is that um, in search of white color jobs. Hello? The search of white color job does not yeah. make a population increase. How does that make a population increase? Okay, you know, in urban more communities. Yeah, you no know, more people would like to go out there. You no, know, like most youth, maybe after school, they don't want to stay back and go into farming and those things, or just settle down for traditional work. But they decide to go to the urban centers to search for the office work and maybe industries and those things. So by that reason, most people troop into the urban centers more than the rural areas. Thank you. Maybe stay. Sir, please, education. I don't understand. What is education? Hello. 
Explain why you think education is important. Most people will move to the urban areas in, um, due to education because in urban areas, there are better facilities for education than. Hello, can you hear me? Rahel, please mute, mute your microphone. Yes, go ahead. Yes, Alina, so I was saying yes, that there are um, Yes, maybe it's a better I facility. Point. Okay. Alina, yes. Um, so I would say because of our religious belief. Mm -hmm. How? This year, um, because um, we are told not to be using the birth control pills in our religious beliefs. So I think that's what causes our urban population to increase. How? How does one not using birth control lead to increased population in urban communities? I don't get it. If anything, it should be the reverse because those ideas are much more popular in the rural communities than urban communities. And even in the rural community, the people cannot even afford these birth control pills and the rest. And so they are more, much more vulnerable. And so probably they will get, uh, I don't know, maybe you may have to come back and explain why you think uh, religion plays a role in that. Um, one, two, three, who else do I pick? Josephine, is your hand fresh? Yes, sir. And then Yvonne, go ahead. Okay, sir, please, I also think that uh, industrialization, which brings about the invention of machines and other, um, other instruments or stuff that makes work easier, had made our um, young people yeah, leave the rural areas because of curiosity. They want to come and experience or use them here in the urban areas because such things are not in the rural areas. When they come here, they come to settle here and then the population at the urban area increases. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you very much. So uh, let me hear you one and then that should be it for now. We will continue later. Yes, you want. Okay. Okay, so I think that some move to the urban areas due to entertainment purposes. Oh. Okay, in the fact that in the urban, in the rural areas, the infrastructures or the um, entertainment, uh, what is the name? Uh, the availability of entertainment isn't isn't that high. You see, since in the urban areas, most of the development happens in the urban areas. The tourist attractions, the the house, the tourist sites, and then the beautiful scenes are in the urban areas. So most youth would like to move from the rural areas just to come and experience it. And when they get here, they will pass it and move back. That's All right, thank you very much. So, I mean, all the points you guys made, again, are correct. My only disappointment or disagreement with you is the way and manner you make those points. The level of analysis is so basic, it's so weak, and some of them are not sustainable, right? And if you pay attention, you realize the weaknesses in the analysis. Generally, it is right. But you see, it is right when you are doing a brief statement, but when you are supposed to write an essay, you're supposed to be a bit more analytical, right? And get the argument. So the question I asked is that, why is it that the population in the urban, uh, in urban communities appears to be rising or keeps increasing? So one of the things you guys need to say essentially is what you just said. They are all one point. It is rural urban migration, that is one. As to why people move from the rural communities, there are many. And essentially, that is what you guys were saying. All of you were giving one or the one reason or the other as to why people move from rural community to the urban communities. Do you get it? 
So these are all into one reason, into one explanation for why people will move. Now, the other reason why the population in urban regions or communities are increasing, you never talked about it. Because you look at the question only as an urban, rural urban migration. But beyond rural urban migration, there are other factors that will make an urban community. So for example, some areas that originally were rural, today cannot be classified as rural because development has catch up in that areas. I'll give you a typical example. I don't know where you guys live, right? But some areas in Accra, 10, 20, 30 years ago, were typical rural areas. There were no electricity, there were no street lights, there were no road, road, there were no schools. But now they actually boast of being the most prime areas in the greater Accra region. The people may not necessarily have moved from the rural community. It's just that that population has, that area has become urbanized. Urbanized by virtue of the population increase, urbanized by virtue of the infrastructure development, urbanized by virtue of development catching up with that area. Do you get a drift? Yes, sir. And I'm sure if I ask you where you live, there are certain areas 10, 15 years ago were rural. There were no electricity, for example. There were no water supply. There were no roads. But the last 10 years, there are roads there. Who can have, give me an example? Pukwase. Pukwase. Yes. So that's interesting. Pukwase, Amasama, Sawam. No, in Sawam has, has, has for a very long time been yeah. an urban settlement. However, by virtue of development, and Sawam has now become so close to Accra that people who live in Ensam may even consider themselves as living in Accra. Right? Good. Yes, any other? It doesn't have to be greater Accra. It can be other regions because this phenomena is not a greater Accra phenomena. Yes, any other? Sir, please, Kaswa. Kaswa is definitely a, a, one, is a, one, one such classical example. Yes, any other? If you come has always been a traditional um Sir, the junction there. Yes, go ahead. I'm, I'm listening. No, yes, the population of a fear has changed, right? But it's a very, um, what we call historical settlement. It is not something you could say the last 10 or 20 years, but obviously I agree with you, if it has become larger than it used to be, they are improving facilities than it, uh, it was or it, 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 yes, or it had been, and all those, and which might characterize almost all urban areas. Right now, there are certain areas that historically were rural, but are no longer rural. And those were the classical examples that you gave us. So now, when we are picking the population in Pukwasi, for example, uh, in 2000, Pukwasi would have been classified as a rural community. So, all the people who lived in Pukwasi, and the population then would have been very small. Do you get it? Would have been very small and they would have been classified as a rural community. But today, if you go to Pukwasi, in any case, don't forget, Pukwasi has the, the first four-tier interchange in the whole of Ghana. And that's the, 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 one of the edifices of uh, a key uh, uh, um, characteristics of an urban city, of, of an urban community or what people refer to as a city, right? And so let your analysis and your conversation go beyond just the surface. Is that okay? Good. Now, as of 2010, these were the major cities 
in um, Ghana with regard to population? Nanama, yes, ask your question. Please, I want to ask that you mentioned development as in the reason for rural urban migration. So if you if someone makes a point that maybe um, people coming for in search of white collar jobs, education, they are all under like development. So if you state development I, as a point. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Nanama, this is what I said. The question was how? How can we explain, okay? How can we explain the, how can we explain the idea that the population in urban communities are increasing in terms of the percentage that you saw? If you look at the data, maybe for the purpose of just reiterating the point. I will just show you the data. Look at it again. From 1960, the percentage of the population in urban communities was 23%. The percentage in 1970 was 29. So consistently, the numbers were improving to the point where by 2010, we had more people living in urban communities than they ever did historically. So the question was that why is it that the population in urban communities are increasing? Is that okay? Yes. And please. then, you, you people started giving reasons why people will move from rural communities to the urban region. I said, yes, all these things happens to be one reason, that there's a rural urban migration. So let's take it this way. Uh, Nanama, which hall are you in? It's Jen Nelson. Jen Nelson, good. Okay, so let's assume that this record is for Jen Nelson that in 20, 2018, you had only 23 females, right? In 2020, they had 29 females. In 2021, you now have 32 females. Consistently, the number of females in Nelson is increasing, right? So when somebody asks you, why is the population of Nelson, the female population of Nelson increasing. Essentially, there could be two reasons, right? That people are moving from other halls and joining Jenelson, right? But those people who are moving from their halls to Jenelson may have a reason why they are moving from their halls. The fact that the reason that A will give to B and a will give for the reason, and B will give maybe different, does not mean that they didn't have a hole. What is common about all of them is that they have moved from their original hole to Jenelson for different reasons. So that would be the first point that I wanted to make. There will be, but with young people moving from their halls, the population of Jenelson may also in, increase, not necessarily because others are moving from their hall to the other places, right? Other reason may be that new admission, new admission may be one. So they are not moving from hall A and B, but they are just first ad ad admission. What about then those who are in, already who are in, in the nursing? Okay, assuming it was a, a permanent residential area. What if they give birth and their children or they get married and their children decide to stay with them. So the population in Genelsi may increase for different reasons and not only because other people are moving from their house and coming to Genelsi. So that's the point that I, was, I wanted you guys to get. And the point I made about these rural communities that some rural communities, the nature of the communities also may change. And so it wasn't because people are coming from other places and coming to increase the population. But some areas which were rural, okay, their nature may just change. And so they themselves may not necessarily be rural again. Does that one help? Yes, Nanama. please. Yes, please. You get a drift, you get a point now. 
Patience. Nyamiche, your hand has been up. Patience, can I continue if you don't have a question? Hello. Yes, go ahead. Please, with the uh, reasons why the population of uh, urban centers has increased, can uh, increase in death rates be one? I can't hear you. You're, 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 you just went so low. Speak up so I can hear you. No, I can't hear you. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Sir. Yeah. Increase, be, increase of birth rate be one of the reasons. It's possible. Increase so of the, the population, can it yes, the population of the uh, former, uh, or yes, so the urban population, as you mean, yes, it is possible. But again, if you are doing a specific case, then we must, there will be data to back it. Do you understand? So it is possible. All right. I think there were other hands. I don't know. If they have all vanished, that's okay. You can manage it with it. So I had talked about the fact that as of 2010, these were the biggest uh, cities or towns in Ghana in terms of the population. So Accra had almost 2 million. Kumasi also had the same 2 million. Tamale had 371, followed by Takwa, they were 311. Second D and then Ashama, 190. These were the six biggest uh, cities in Accra. Now, why do people move? We have already discussed that one. There are things that you know, so I wouldn't waste my time so much. So the people move for two main reasons. People move for two main reasons. The first one is the economic uh, centrifugal, or what we call the push factors, because they are not satisfied. And that's what some many of you are talking about. The one who was talking about lack of employment opportunity, lack of entertainment, the desire to have some social amenity and all that. So essentially, those are what we call the push. Because the environment, okay, in that region, or uh, they lack these things, then they are forced to go to other places where they can get these resources, right? So they are able to um, assess uh, uh, such resources. Okay, so these are like, like the conditions within those territories push people, is that okay? to those regions, right? So the factors are many, economic factors, social factors, the lack of social amenities and lack of integrity. But beyond that, there's also what we call the pool factors. You see, if the conditions are bad in your area, but you don't have anywhere to go, you remain put. Hello? Hi. Hi. All right. Okay, Hi. so the point I'm making is that yes, you may not be satisfied with what you have. You may live in a very deplorable conditions. You may have higher expectation, but if you have nowhere to go, you still stay put. You think those who are in the rural communities and are in a very deplorable area, they don't know, they know. It's just that they do not have anywhere else to go. So they may remain there. So the point is that it is not enough to talk about the lack or the absence of certain things. But for one to move, the person first must have the capacity to move. And finally, this capacity must reflect in ability to where to go. So it is people who are also moving from the rural communities because they think that when they go to some places, they are going to get better jobs. So those who move for economic reasons, those who move for social reasons, also think that if it is about a rigid and uh, so strict 
issues about culture and the things, then they think that, okay, when we come to the urban areas, the stress is going to be probably minimal or, or something to, 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 to that effect, right? The cultural attractions, you have talked about it, the availability of social amenities and what have you. A majority of our students, when they come from the smaller communities and they come to experience Legon, they never want to go back to experience what they were used, they used to experience and rather want to stay in Accra and make ends meet, as you guys discussed, or move to other relatively well-established cities or bigger cities with a general understanding that those cities may offer better results or better. Right? So what does that mean? When people are moving from the rural areas, as indicated, the impacts are twofold. Where the people are living, we can look at the discussion. So normally this is what happens. The rural economy then begins to suffer. So many of you are thinking about why food has become overly expensive. Yes, because the people who would have stayed back to work have all left and they have come to Accra and Kumasi where there will be no farmland for them to work on. So the fewer women who are usually the very old ones are those who are cultivating the food, right? And so there will be few and fewer uh, food on the market. And the basic economic will tell you that as scarcity sets in, prices of such commodities begin to shoot up, right? And so these are some of the impact on the rural communities, which then begin to even reflect in the urban areas as well, right? People talk about the fact that the traditional religion then also begins to weaken. Because when the people move from the rural communities and they come to Accra, in an Accra or in an urban setting where the, 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 the anonymity somehow is, I mean, assured, right? You do not. People also lose the kind of control that the family used to assert on them. And one of the things we talked about in the traditional Ghanaian society, of course, last semester, is the fact that as people move, okay, and gain economic independence, the fear, the, 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 the reverence that they used to give to their traditional authorities are weak because they no longer depend. In the past, they would have depended on the Abusia Penny for a parcel of land. And on that basis, they owe so much allegiance to him. He comes to the university, he grows up to become a lecturer. He doesn't need a land from the Abusia Penny. In fact, in most cases, even the land has been already been sold, depleted, and all that. So when the Abusia Penny calls, he decides whether to respond or not to respond. In other words, he probably has more economic power than the, 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 the Abushia Penny or whoever that one is. So essentially, look at that kind of conversation, think through it, and then let's see how it goes. What about the urban areas? What happens when people move in droves? We talk about the challenges with unemployment. So many guys are here, and you all saw the, the picture last year. No, not last year, last month when uh, the Youth Employment Agency decided to do job fair, look at the volume of people who trooped to the Accra Conference Center in search of job. Yet the impression has been created that there were jobs in Accra and that if they had moved from the rural community and come to Accra, they would have survived and have made much more economic resources, right? So you see the Kaya yeah, so many of them. Look at the sanitation situation. And these are the places that people are living, right? Some of these places are so expensive that even those who are working and making the thousands will still find it very expensive. Yes, but that is the only available. So there's a housing challenge, there's a sanitation challenge. And look at how Accra suddenly has become. Anytime it rains, Accra is easily flooded. And what have you, these are all the challenges because there are more people, there are more people than 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 um, the city can actually accommodate. And so places and land that were originally not supposed to have been sold are now being sold. Right. So you have these scenes, mostly in urban centers, where people who are supposed to work because they have no job to do will be idling. Right, so I talk about two key terms here, unemployment and underemployment. Unemployment is the situation where somebody who is, has a particular set of skills, 
he is willing to work, he's made himself available to be employed or to work, and yet he's unable to find a job. Such people are called unemployed people. Okay, so there are three very important things. One, he has a set of skills. He's made himself available to work, okay, and yet he's unable to get something to do. Then he becomes unemployed. So if you have a set of skills, you have gone to school, you have graduated, but you have not made yourself available for work, you can't be dis described as unemployed. So just like Mario or whoever, he said that he was at uh, the fair, uh, Elliot, Elliot Beth, he said he was there. I don't know why he was there. You are still in school. So technically once you are in school, you are not supposed to be described as unemployed. But what about the situation where he thinks that he probably may combine his job with his education? So he made himself available and he wasn't successful. So he thinks that he, he should be added to the unemployment. The other group is the underemployment. Underemployment, underemployed people are, are not unemployed. Underemployed simply means is that he's doing something that is below his capacity. So let me give you a typical example. So if, for example, there's a PhD holder who by our current standard, if we, are, we have a PhD, you are either a, a, a researcher or you should be a lecturer in, in, in a university or in a higher level learning institution. If you got there's no job, this PhD holder settles to teach in primary school, right? The thinking generally will be that where he's actually working is below his capacity. Having done a PhD, he should be engaged in instructing at the higher level. Because of a basic school, people think that no. But again, you will still find PhDs who are teaching in primary school because their PhD that they acquired is for them to understand how to work at the basic level. So under such circumstances, you won't say that that person is underemployed. Please, do you understand? All right, so these are some of the things. So you find so many young people who are doing something below their capacity, below their ability, because that is the only way they can survive. When it happens like that, we call it underemployment. My, I think this is my last slide. So I've talked about these ones, the urban poverty, hmm. insecurity in urban Who areas. Tech. Chantel, you are distracting the class. High unemployment, I've talked about it. The kinship ties gives away for associational life. So most, most people no longer talk about their family members, it's about the school they attended. It is about the club, the church that they build. And then we also talk about the pressure on social amenities. And I mean, you see the overcrowding in almost everywhere you go, the hospitals and all those other things. In fact, we are talking about double track and people say that it has jeopardized the quality of education or it appears to have done all the governments who also explaining that no, the interaction hours have increased and all that other thing. At the same time that some schools have been so oversubscribed, there are still schools that are struggling to have numbers, right? There are still schools that are having, and that's just what it is. Because the general understanding is that these elite schools are usually in urban communities. In the same way, we think that some better facilities are here. And so you leave them there. So all the social amenities and facilities in, 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 in some of these places are are not. Okay, so before this discussion, I have to insert this question. Is urbanization, is urbanization a problem? Because what I have discussed so far appears to make urbanization a problem, right? We talk about the inefficiencies, the corruption, the insecurity, the unemployment, the weakening of kinship ties and all those other things. The question I want to ask, is urbanization a problem? Sefako says yes, I don't know why he says yes. Yes, 
if you are going to repeat all these things for me, then I, okay, I understand you. This school of thought of which to some extent, I am a firm believer, though not very popular, is that urbanization is actually not a problem and that it is actually a resource that can actually be tapped to maximize and speed up development. Why some people think that urbanization is not a problem? I want to share three points with you. One, the first point is that it is the fastest means by which social amenities can be extended to the largest numbers of the population. One, I want to repeat. The argument is that it's, a, it's the easiest way to make um, social, we can talk about it as services available to population, particularly for underdeveloping countries. And I may use, just so you, 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 you probably will understand. Do you know how much or it will take, for example, to build the Achimotes, the Adisadils, the academies, the Wesley girls across the country? If you want to have the quality of education that Achimota, the Presex guarantees across the country. Do you know how much it will cost Ghana, for example, to build the Achimotes? And I use them in that general understanding as you all have. And so you can take up more students, okay? by just increasing the structures that Archwater, for example, have. And within a short period of, let's say, a year or two, you are guaranteed that if Archimota took in 1,000 students, you are going to have extra 1,000 more students simply because the infrastructure in Archimota has been improved. As compared to trying to build another Achimota at Kaswa, the culture of, uh, of Achimota to be transposed in Kaswa will probably take you 20 years before you build it. Because Achimota has a history of almost 80 years. And that is how the culture of academic excellence has been built in Ashmota. What is the argument to the population? The argument is that when there are more people in Accra, for example, it is easier to connect these more people to water, to good sanitation, to good roads, and all that you, than extending electricity to Koyobeda only to satisfy 50 people. But the population of Amasaman is almost 500,000. It is easier to extend electricity from um, Kwabenya to Amasaman to service a population of 500,000 than to extend electricity from Adafo to Kodiabe, which has a population of little over 120 people. And these are capital intensive. And the population in that community itself is so small that you will never be able to recoup the capital expenditure extended, expended to extend the trees. In fact, some of these rural communities, when the trees, for example, is extended to them, the cost for the ECG to go and collect the bills or distribute the bills is much more expensive than the bills that they are supposed to pay. And so sometimes they don't even go there again. 
Because you go to the whole community and they say that part, they are part of Ghana, so they should be extended, electricity should be extended to them. And the population is just about 550 people. But they also want electricity. Do you know how much one transformer will cost? Even the cables and the number of poles from one of the biggest communities to that place, it will cost the governor by a million Ghana cities to extend electricity to 50 people. But if these people had been clustered in another center, that same one million, that is to be extended for a five kilometers stretch of electricity extension, will service over 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 population. And the population will make a lot of economic sense so that the ECG can go there, collect their bills. And in any case, once you come to an urban center, your consumption rate of electricity becomes higher as compared to the rural communities. What do they use electricity for? It's just for lighting in the evening. Some of them is just one bulb. And because of one bulb, you are extending a whole electricity that will cost you about five, a million dollars or a million Ghana cities to that. So that is one of the argument. The second argument, okay, uh, Aniate Yukim. Uh, uh, morning, sir. Yeah, good morning. But the resources is there. If you have that base on that argument, mm -hmm. Ghana has the resources. It does not really matter if they have to extend the electricity to five people. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the nation is being blessed. So why think about how much it will cost Ghana? Mm -hmm to extend electricity to 50 people. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, uh, most developed countries come to mm -hmm. take those resources from here. Mm -hmm. Like the crude oil. Mm -hmm. the, uh, um, do you know how much it costs to actually sell um, an Air Force carrier mm -hmm. for six months? Mm -hmm. But the resources is being taken from Africa. Mm -hmm. Mostly Ghana and maybe neighboring country like Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, for the base, you were actually arguing um, like, it's, uh, like it's not an ideal thing to extend the electricity to them. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's why I came in, sir. Oh, no, no, I mean, that's, that's a very welcoming uh, uh, contribution, but you know, the point that I will, I, and I, I mean, I perfectly share with you, but again, one of the things that as economists, we always say is that, yes, you, today you may think that you have the resources, but resources are never infinite. Resources are generally limited. Today you may think, but again, I was just telling you about the cost of even extending these things and the sustainability of that argument. For a businessman, right? For the businessman, it is about the profitability or the returns on that investment. I don't disagree with the position that you have taken. And in fact, like I said, that is the dominant argument. But there's another set of literature that is emerging. Okay, and the argument they made is that instead of seeing urbanization as a problem, we can rather look at urbanization as a resource that is not properly harnessed. Right, it is ideal to say that why not? I mean, have the resources, but the question you ask yourself is what is the opportunity cost for that resource? Couldn't that resource be put to a better use? And I agree perfectly with you if these resources are being tapped and the people are not getting the benefit expected of, then, like you are, you are saying, then it's better to even just make sure that at least the citizenry benefit from it, not necessarily by clustering them like the way urbanization yeah. does, and all those other arguments. So I do not challenge the, the dominant view, but it's also to make our students and all of us to also think beyond just what the dominant view is and what the micro view also is. That instead of seeing urbanization because there are so many clustering, I mean, the density and all those resources are there, you can also look at the potential or the other opportunities that 
uh, urbanization also present to all of us. Uh, Famiye, your hand is up. I want to hear you so that I can just run off the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Yuki, for your contribution. Yes, sir. Thank you, um, Famiye. Uh, I want to say, like, pair your thoughts. Like, we are made to understand that, like, in this case, we are building just a city and not a country. Because if we are to focus on only the urban areas, living there, maybe I'm an investor. I want to, I want a piece, a, a large piece of land to set up a company. And mm -hmm. the urban areas, looking at its population, there are less lands, but there are more lands in the rural, rural areas where there, are, there is no electricity. So if I consider there is electricity in that way, I'll go and set up my business there. And that will like contribute to their development. That's my thought. Yeah, that's a very, so again, maybe the, let's stay, stay with the electricity extension argument, just so we can have this sustained argument. And I like, the idea that are coming. So, in fact, most people, in fact, this argument that I'm making, you, you, you think that it may just apply for consumer, but for commercial uses, your argument is right. Because like you are saying, you are not just building a city, you are also building a country. And in a country comprises of all spheres and all aspects of all parts of the country. So yes, your argument is on there. And again, you don't want a situation where everybody is trooping to a particular area, right? Just to assess a particular resource that is supposed to be common to every member of the community. So that's good. But again, you see, look at what has been happening. Some industries, no matter what you do, will never go to the rural communities. Rural communities, because the population has already been depleted. Do you, have, do you get the argument? And I think even more. One is the resource. So if, for example, the resource base is, is the resource to be utilized in the establishment or in the production is found in the rural communities, it will make economic sense for the factory to be set there, right? But again, you also need a human capital. The question most people will ask themselves. So for example, in 2016, um, six, no, I think 2015 or so, I think it's 2015 or 2016, uh, um, when President Mahama, and let's bring it home, was building these e-blocks, the first e-block that was built was built in the central region and was named after the late president, President J. E. Mills. That secondary school happened to have been a day school, right? It was built in the Atamil's hometown, Otuam. The population of Otuam, of school going age was less than 200 as at the time the school was built. The adjacent communities that could assess the school required to at least board two minimum transports before they can assess the school. And so within two years of the establishment of the school, the school nearly collapsed. Why? Because it became more expensive for the individual to assess the school. In that same vein, one of the schools was built in Dome, Kwabenya, a very urban community, built up community. And within one year, the school had a population of 1,300. And to date, that school is always full. Why? Because it is not just about the school, it is about people going to the school. So it is this whole argument. So when the factory wants, somebody wants to go to set, a, set a factory in a particular area, it's not only looking for the natural resources, but it's also looking out for the, um, um, what do you call it? The human resource. Would he find people there to work in the factory? Would he, and, or even if he will not find it, is the environment so conducive for somebody to be moved from Accra, Kumasi, and all that to come there? So it's a very composite 
uh, discussion. And I like the, the fact that this uh, school of thought is bringing out some of these critical discussions. Um, Yvonne, I think I saw your hands up. You probably will be the last person I want to listen to and then we'll call off the, 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 the class because the time is very much spent. Yes. Yvonne, or you have abandoned the idea of asking a question. All right, thank you very much. So let's have that conversation um, when you meet in your group. Ask, is urbanization really a problem? And ask yourself, challenge yourself, think beyond the dominant thesis. And for those who see urbanization as a problem, the other argument that they have asked is that why don't we do establishment of agro-based industries to stop the tide? And that is one of the things that has informed governments uh, 1D, 1F. What is the argument? The argument is that let's build a factory so that because it's the lack of jobs in the communities, that is why they come, right? And so every district, let's find one um, business opportunity and then set a factory. Some have started. In fact, just yesterday, he was commissioning the shoe factory. The day before, he has commissioned the, 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 the garment factory. And um, the Apple farms in Ashanti region has been refatalized, yes, and all those. So we are spreading development. And that's the argument that uh, I think Famiye made, that development is about building a country and not just building a city. So that's one of the arguments. So let's invest in rural areas. So government, what is government doing? The rural areas is the capital, is the food basket of the nation. So planting for food and jobs. Let's push people, let people have a reason to stay in, urban, in the rural areas and produce more food so that we wouldn't have to import the basic staples of Ghana. That is the argument. So the issue also is about access to land. There's so much complication with land. So let's try to address them. What has government been doing? Let's provide in, inputs, okay? Inputs for these farmers so that they will, they will, they will they will, they, will, they, will, they will do what they are supposed to <laughs> do. Let's get the road linked. What has been government effort? The government effort, you remember these cocoa roads where the cocoa board then begins to use um, resources to ensure that the roads, the roads uh, lead into the farming areas where the cocoa is produced, it's been done, yes, and all that. So, because we have seen urbanization as a problem, let's get people stay in the rural community. So you see all these efforts are geared towards making people feel at home and staying back and what have you. Let people stay longer in school. What do we do? Free senior high school. Let people then stay, right? And so, because the whole idea is that they couldn't afford secondary school. So let's make it free so that they can stay. And what do we do? Let's build schools. So government was building secondary schools in communities that didn't have secondary school so that the people will not have to come to Accra, Kumasi, Tema, and all that. If the schools are closer to them, they will attend and all that. So these are some of the discussion generally about how to address the problem of rural urban migration. Yvonne, you came back again. I don't know if you still have your hand up. If not, then I thank you for making yourself available. If there's any question I would like to take, finally. If not, then um, Yvonne, yes, speak. Oh, Yvonne, your network is bad. I can hardly hear a word from you. Maybe you just need to put it in the chat whilst we are running out because we can barely hear you. So thank you very much, um, colleagues, and we will meet hopefully next week. I wish you all the best. Um, the recordings will be made available to you um, through your course rep, um, Precious and then uh, Jimfi. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good day. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Adios. Okay. Au revoir. 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 Au revoir.